can get to Cincinnati in less time than he can get to Pasadena. He flew to Phoenix, and he's driving from there to – I forget where. Oh, is he driving with Bill Marcel? Phoenix to Pasadena. Hey, Welcome everybody. To Pasadena. Welcome to Wood Chat for October 10th. I'm Matt Gradwall. Um, our party has been crashed. Uh, Chris Wong flew down to Phoenix and uh, is driving to Pasadena, so he's not able to join us. But with the move to a 7 p.m. 7 p.m. start time for Wood Chat – there's a Pacific. whole bunch of troublemakers that joined us tonight, and uh, MWA Live, MWA Nationals in the house. Um, there's this guy who released a monkey in Florida. Um, say hi, Stinky. I, I I can't I can't say anything without a subpoena. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> Unless I get a subpoena, I can't answer any of your questions. Yeah, this is like um, this is like the outbreak movie, the Centers for Disease Control, or trying to hunt down Patient Zero or whatever. The, the the crazy monkey yes and then over from over from uh, the east coast with small headphones not big headphones hi say hi Nick oh that's me mm -hmm. <laughs> I was one. looking at all the pictures trying yeah. to figure out which one are you guys are I thought you were headphones. talking about me because these are my small headphones I have real yeah, headphones these small headphones yeah hey Your big headphones have shag carpet on the outside how's it going which chat is good to be back good. I'm glad we could finally get the scheduling worked out so that yeah. MWA Live at 9 p.m. Eastern, what's that, 6 p.m. Pacific? Yeah. yeah. Followed by discussion over here on WoodChat. Should yeah. be good. Yeah. Should be good. And then we got Wicked Pissa. Say hi. <laughs> Yummy yeah, little WoodChat. Me again? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the old Boston show. Yeah. What's the hopper? <laughs> so, Don't forget the meatloaf. The commercial ever. Uh, and then we have uh, and then we have the badass biker ink guy. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> That's Girl. right. I'm I'm wearing my. Yeah, I'm gonna get ragged for it all night. <laughs> That's all right. What's going on, man? I just heard. Oh, that's a good one, Tom. There we go. Everybody, roll up your sleeves now. Everybody, roll your sleeves up tonight, because everybody, Chris Atkins from Atlanta, Georgia, 250 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait! I'm even wearing my Warrior Dash shirt tonight, so I'm I'm trying Did to be the badass tonight. I've I've actually ran it uh, six times, something like that. Really. I actually ran it twice back to back one year. The first year I ran it, it was I so get much fun. I get tired watching highlight videos of that. When you say back to back, does that mean you finished it, turned around, and did it again, or yes. is that two days in a row, or two months in a row, or we forgot how? something? No, time. no, I ran it. I ran it once, and my wife wanted to go, and so as soon as I finished, she goes, uh, she goes, oh, I'm going to go do it now. Um, and she said, will you go back with me? So I ran back through the course again. So I can tell you the load. Um, and Chris and I was is completely out. covered head to tail in mud. So um, I'll be interested to see if anybody else joins this chat if Chris gets dropped again. <laughs> is that, is that a typical pattern? Yeah. yeah. Every, every time somebody joins, Chris gets dropped. Every time. So I find that yeah. if I use Chrome... I get booted out a lot, which blows me away. You have Chrome's disease. The Google Chrome. effects don't work in IE, though. Yeah, they do. No, you know what's funny? When I when I created a Hangout under the WoodChat profile, I can't use Lower Third. When I create a Hangout under my um, Uppercut Woodworks profile, works fine. So I don't know what's going on. Yes. But I'm using IE10 on Windows 8, so... Pages. And whoever, and whoever belched, nice push. Um, so, did you guys just finish talking about uh, Woodworking America a lot? I thought I saw a lot of shop design talk. We talked a little bit about it up front, and then we talked power and lighting. Okay. So, so we're happy to talk more about WIA. Yeah. So let me let me tell you. Want to hear about my shop power and lighting? Yeah. Yeah. So Maybe. I bought this house about ten years ago. First thing I did when I got the key was tear a bunch of drywall off the walls in the garage. Um, and put in my own circuits and put in my own outlets. And I did 20 amp, 110 volt, and I did one uh, 30 amp, 220 volt. I wish I would have done a lot more 220 volt because now I have a 220 joiner and a 220 planer. That's why I'm running 21, whatever it takes, you know. And um, I wish I had put outlets on more walls. They're all on the back wall where the panel is. 
Um, because I hate extension cords. Hate them, hate them, hate them. Um, what else did I do? Uh, they're all, the lighting is on a separate circuit, and it's I got a ton of uh, the no hum, no flicker, natural light tube lights in there. Let me see if I can find a picture. I might be able to find a picture. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell you we're getting all kinds of of uh, thanks for this new scheduling. Everybody seems to like it. I know they're freaking out, which is great because it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, and it actually, I my job just recently changed, so it's really helping me out because now I can um, come home, have dinner with my family if they were here right now. They're in Disneyland, and then um, the plan is to do woodshop from the south. Oh, that'd be cool. What are you eating, Tom? Are you drink? Oh, you're drinking and lime. Limes. Yeah. Um, the other thing I did was I epoxied the floor, had insulation blown into the walls. And um, put in a gas stove because I get most of my woodworking during the winter. So, and in, in Washington in the winter, it starts to get dark at like 3.30, which is depressing as hell. So it lights up very, very bright and uh, stays very, very warm. So, and I'm going to try and find a um, picture here. Do you do any shop work in the summer? Matt, no, do you have to cool been, it? It's been really light. My last major project I installed on Memorial Day. And since then, I've been helping a buddy build a, a Telecaster guitar. He's already got the neck and the electronics. So we're just doing the body. And I've been doing repairs, little repair jobs for people. Fix a drawer, fix a table leg, fix a crack table, stuff like that. Fix a cat. <laughs> a cat? Yeah. You got to take a dog out to get fixed, right? <laughs> I, do, I do neuter... I do neuter for a minimal charge. Um, and which chisel do you use for that? The Just sharp one. Nail gun. Oh, I was going to say the dull one. That's a one inch. <laughs> <laughs> two cherries works really well. Here's Aren't you glad we joined in? It's about two one cherries. inch. Um, so I didn't find a um, picture that shows off the lighting, but I found a picture that shows off, shows off the... Uh, Good guns. Not the guns. Shows off the stove. So I'll sh put that in a screen share real quick. If Google doesn't suck at doing this real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not getting political at all. Or, you know. um, well, when are you guys going to come out with an equivalent service? We'll use it. Which service? Oh, Hangouts? I don't know if we ever will. I'm, I'm not in that division. Ooh, it's so is shot. the shop showing on the screen? Yes, it is. Yep. Until Tom talks. So you yep. can see the... Um, can you see the? You can see the stove over on the far left, right and under the dartboard. Yeah, right underneath the dartboard by my fly fishing boots. Um, and those buckets <laughs> aren't. Those buckets next to the gas stove aren't full of lighter fluid. Don't worry. <clears throat> or uh, lack of thinner. This is why I the whole picture. This is when I was building the fish tank stand. Um. So this is a little bit older of a picture because the cyclone's not in there and things like that. So. You said it's a gas stove. Yeah, it's get natural gas, and it's just on a thermostat, and it just keeps it warm and um, and dry in there. I really don't have a problem with rust in my shop, which is amazing for Washington. Um, that was pretty good. I can appreciate that the stove keeps it dry in the winter. How do you keep it dry in the summer? I would think inactivity and humidity would create rust. Yeah, we've we've gone seventy eight days without rain. Wow. In in Seattle. So you rely on droughts to keep your tools rust-free? Drought, yeah. Um, I'm, re I'm relying on global warming to control my rust. That sounds like a great plan. And so far it's working. So far it's working. That's why I put in the natural gas, more emissions, and then I get... Oh, why not? Yeah. But... Um, I think we've got about 78 minutes without rain here in Florida. No, that's the wrong one. Don't show that one. Show that one. So if you look above the stove, you'll see... Um, Gray outlets, and then there's to the right of that. There's another bank of outlets, and to the right of that, there's another bank of outlets. And basically, those go all the way down the wall. So I have I can run whatever I want on, and I have dedicated 20 amp circuits, and I don't have any problems. So that, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And then what I did was I color coded them. So 
to the left of the electrical panel, the gray outlets share a circuit, and the white outlets share a separate circuit. To the right, it's another set of colors. <clears throat> so you were listening before, right? You, you're just cribbing what I said in our podcast a few minutes ago. I, yes. I only heard the last <laughs> few minutes. And climbing into his time machine. <laughs> Yeah. Going back and then reinstalling his switching lanes. Went back in <laughs> color code. No, I only, I only saw the last few minutes. But, but what I wish I had done is on the far wall behind the bench, I wish I had put some outlets. And then on the um, outlet in the corner where the dust collector is, I wish I had put some. And then on the wall that's opposite the wall where the miter saw is, I wish I had put some because uh, I just – like I have this 220-volt – extension cord I made and I'm flopping it around and I got a trick like if I go from joiner to planer to table saw I'm moving it around and there's been a couple times where I've um, caught it with the corner of my table saws mobile base and I don't really want to use it after that when I when I tear it up so I wish I'd put it's it in 220. Hmm? It's all 220. It's don't only worry. 30 amps of 220 so. 30 amps 220 don't worry about it. Why Let's do you need it. 30 amps? None of those tools are 30 amps are they? Um, my table saw is a five horse. Okay, that's what ten amps. No, it's it, it's it's not there. It's not more than twenty. It's fifteen. I think it's fifteen each pole. I was just going over this with an electrician, and he thinks I'm going overkill by going tw uh, going twenty amps. No, I, I I did the twenty. I can't remember um who I talked to about who I talked to about that, but uh, or if it was in the manual or whatever, but. I did what was recommended, and, and I'm <laughs> well, the, glad I did. The, the beauty about 220 is, you know, when, when like today I discovered when the electrician came in, that, um, you know, if, if you're using 30 amp, the plug is a different shape than a 20 amp, and a 40 amp and a 50 amp, they're all different shapes. So yeah, they're, they're NEMA, trying to it's figure a NEMA it out. 30. Yeah. It's a NEMA 30 twist lock, um, and I really like the twist lock. Um but you can do, I mean, the truth is, as long as the plug and the outlet and the circuit breaker and the um, cable all are all copacetic with it, you can choose whatever plug you want. But as I long like as to you put, don't go I like, over the amperage. What's that? As long as you don't screw up the amperage. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. Don't, you don't want to screw that up because that's, that's when the uh, extension cord gets really hot. <laughs> starts to dance. I kind of like cigarettes off mine sometimes. You can do what? Light cigarettes off of my yeah. extension cords. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's I I don't know. It's been good. The, the the joiner and the planer seem to need less power than the table saw. So, um, so nobody, none of you guys are going to Pasadena, right? Yeah, yes, you guys are. Chris and you are? Yeah, myself and Nick are both going. Oh, that's right, because you guys are helping doing the uh, hand we're tool. We're doing the right? hand tool, right? And Matt, since you're going, we're going to rely on you to teach them, right? Because they're both woodworking in America versions. Tom is going to Tom is going to teach mm -hmm. them how to do backwards Italian dovetails <laughs> that allow for easy disassembly. <laughs> look at him, look Knock at down him. dovetails. They're the, they're what I call IKEA dovetails. It, it makes it easy to put the furniture together. Well, you know, if the IKEA dovetails, you'd have to use the Allen wrench to put. And them then up. I'm going to teach people so. how to kill Aaron Marshall. By oh, turning your handsaw into a um, a wood catapult. I had forgotten about that. Oh. There's no way you could. Hey, Aaron, Aaron's going to be there, too. Again. Aaron's going to be in Pasadena. Well, yeah. last year, Tom helped me pick out some awesome handsaws and, uh, from Mark Harrell. Remember that, Tom? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And he sent those to me, and I don't know why I would use a miter saw, uh, like, I mean, I still love my table saw, but the thing cuts automatically square and plumb. You know, the, and, and, and I, I remember. Set it on the wood and say, "Go." And I remember you when don't you even got have it. to touch it. No, I remember when you, man. I remember when you got those two saws. One of them, both of them, were, were filed as as crosscut saws, and they refiled one yeah. for a rip saw. Yeah, he refiled one for me. So it was the same saw. It was just a, he completely redid the teeth for you. And how's that one working? Unbelievable. Like. I've never – so here's here's my – here's the thing I always tell people that when they find out I'm into woodworking, they say, yeah, you know, I tried that once and blah, blah, blah. And, I, and they usually get to their frustration with hand tools. And I said, look, if you were frustrated with the hand tools you were using, it wasn't your fault. It was whoever maintained that hand tool gave you something crappy. And it's like 
if you use a really good hand plane or a really good chisel or a really good handsaw, now you understand that how before World War II, everything actually got built with just human power. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't need because they just knew how to maintain their tools. Um, and so then I got back and I said, okay, this is pretty amazing. And uh, I had a bunch of my old, my grandfather's old saws. So I sent them to Matt, Matt Cianci because Mark said he was too busy to um, sharpen them. Mm -hmm. You guys know Matt Cianci, the saw right? Yeah. And he sent, he, he's, he basically said, that of the three saws you sent me, two of them are not worth saving. It's just like, you know, they're, they're just not worth it. And uh, one of them had a, a kink in it that was just going to not work its way out. But he said the other one was fine, and he, and he sharpened that and sent it back. And, I mean, like on a handsaw and with one push stroke, you're going like two or three inches. It's just ridiculous, right? So probably filed, and yeah, I mean sharpened. It's it's yeah. it, it's quite an experience. Yeah. So my brother said he found six more of my grandpa's old saws, so he's gonna deliver those, and I'm I'm pretty stoked. I'm pretty stoked about that. You know, I mean, I, I'm gonna have to nice. talk to you, Matt, because I've got a I've got an old distant. Um, I can't remember. I think it's a number eight uh, rip with five tooth per inch, and it's just yeah. been sitting here, and I've been meaning to do something with it, and it's like. I gotta, I gotta either get it sharpened or give it to somebody who can, who can get it sharpened. Yeah. Send it up to Matt Cianci. He's, I went to high school with him actually. Did you really? Yeah. Yep. He lives around the corner from me. Uh, but I gave him a couple of my saws. Uh, amazing, the difference. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, and then what the the trick is, send them out to get professionally, like where they join the plate to make it flat. And he redoes the teeth, and he redoes the set, and he files them. Mm -hmm. And then, you, if you want to, if you want to touch up, touch it up after six months, just use what's there as your guide, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if if the if the saw was totally douched, send it out to somebody to have it professionally fixed, right? <laughs> Douche, yes. But then, but then just 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 lightly, and he's like, it's like two strokes per. Just lightly set set the teeth back up, and um, and use what's there as your guide. Um, now, if you if you run it over with a car or something, you're screwed. But um, it's been it's it's ridiculous. Um, I what I need to do is build a, a really good um, hand saw bench that's the right height for my short yeah. stubby legs. Because I have a problem on a higher bench getting up over and up, over it enough, and then I bend the saw. You know, Matt, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, you know, a lot of people, when they get frustrated with hand tools, they think, well, I can't use hand tools. And a lot of them may be using the hand tool in the wrong position, uh, at the wrong height. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, picking up a saw and cutting. There's, there's, yeah. there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, technique, well, technique plays a big role in it, but I think Matt hit it right on the head. Most people pick up a poorly maintained tool mm -hmm. and get frustrated because it doesn't cut right, doesn't cut square, right. doesn't cut easily and they say this 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 sucks I'm getting rid of this yeah. if but, ripping like a fur 2 by 8 takes you forever and makes you sweat the tool sucks or right. the technique the technique might the technique might suck but if it's a sharp tool and your technique sucks if you'll get a right not square too. cut mm -hmm. right but it, sh it shouldn't slow you down I, I mean unless you're just not engaging the teeth with the wood um I'm sure it's the right tool, tool though. <laughs> what, yeah, yeah, you, you might get in and bind it. it. You might be using a rip saw to cross cut or a cross cut saw to rip. But and uh, if it's if it's not set for for soft woods or if it's a little too yeah. wet, you know, you, yeah. you got to make sure you're using the right tool for the job. Yeah. Or if you get a kickback, you can try to kill somebody with it. Worked for me. Um, I'll give you I'll give you another example. I had these uh, old uh, hand planes, and Christopher Schwartz wrote about a machinist in Illinois. What the heck was that guy's name? I know I have one of his planes. He guy's fantastic. I I think I talked to you about him years a year ago or so. Yeah, I sent a ton of my planes name. into the guy, and I keep meaning to. Um, his name is. It's going to pop up here in two seconds. Steve Nisbet. Yeah. And I keep meaning to do a, a video on a blog post on him. You send him your planes, and he has a menu of different different things he'll do. And then he looks at your planes and he says, okay, for your first number four, I recommend we do 
X, Y, Z, whatever. And he'll fix your panning, remove rust. But he takes him into his machine shop, he machines the sole perfectly flat, and he'll even machine the soles perfectly flat and perfectly perpendicular, uh, the side perfectly perpendicular to the sole. He'll fix the Japanning, he'll fix the handles, stuff like that. I got him back, I put in a brand new Hawk Blades and Chip Breakers, and <laughs> they're, it's ridiculous. It's here for Ron. Yeah, uh, he's gonna be he's gonna be there. I got a I got an email, I got an email from them about their booth at Pasadena, so I'm gonna stop by. But um, now and for the five, I think I sent them five planes, and to have them all restored was like three hundred bucks. So sixty That's bucks. A deal. Of, it's a complete deal. Sixty bucks of because like I don't want to be in the business of restoring my tools. I'll be in the business of maintaining them, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be like a tool restorer guy. Yeah. Like those guys on that old tool website where they take those old power tools and restore them. That's a job that's, unto itself. That's, yeah, yeah, that's it's a different hobby together. It's a different hobby, right? And so yeah. I'll keep my blade sharp. I'll keep the rust off of them. But now that they're restored, um, they're pretty awesome. And so and I've got enough of them that I can set one up with a camber and I can set one up for hogging, you know, and dimensioning and have have a couple smoothers and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. You talk about how cheap it is for him to tune up the plane you already have. I bought a, a used number eight from him, and yeah. I don't even know what brand it is, but he did all this, all the uh, machining on it. It's it's like it's brand new, and I think it cost me 175 bucks. Yeah, it's ridiculous. What? How big is the number eight? I don't know. It's, it's bigger it's than seven. Big. Yeah, it's bigger than my screen. It's 20, 20 something. It's a little bigger than seven. I think it's 22 inches, something like that. Yeah. That's the that's yeah. the kind that you might clamp. And keep the keep the plane stationary and move the wood, like a like a Cooper, a four foot long Cooper's plane. So um, well, it's gonna be more than my twenty seven. Holy uh, smoke! Twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. Biggest plane, basically. All right, so go ahead. So tell me, tell me what's going on with the hand tool Olympics at WIA and. I know Chris Wong and email, emailed me and said, "Hey, if you got an hour, can you help?" But what's what's up? Uh, basically, we've been just talking with uh, with Pop Woodworking, and we are going to be. Um, um, no one was toasting the Hand Tool Olympics in in um, out in Pasadena, so we kind of got involved with it, and we're going to be hosting it. Uh, what we're doing is we're kind of scaling it back just a little bit but not a lot uh, we are going to on Saturday I'm sorry Friday and Saturday we're going to do the hand tool Olympics from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, will be the hours that people can come out and compete uh, we're going to be doing ripping cross cutting um, dovetails and then edge planing so it should be pretty excited we should have uh, myself Nick uh, and Chris is going to be there quite a bit, and we've had some other volunteers, but we definitely uh, cool. we, we definitely could still use some other volunteers for it. But so you guys fun. have all the jigs from the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, or are you bringing your own? Or? Um, what, what we did was they, they basically, um, we are. We've got a couple of the clamps and stuff that, that those guys were using. They've sent us, I think actually Nick is going to get there early uh, tomorrow, and... and uh, Maybe start working on those a little bit. So um, we'll see. Nick? <laughs> that crap. <laughs> yeah. Are you just now finding out that you're signed up for this duty? Uh, yeah, no, I, I just forgotten that I had suggested that we build them. Hopefully Chris Wong shows up with some wood. <laughs> sure. There might be. the job a little easier. Yeah. Tom's got wood over his shoulder. He can bring it. That and I also have right next to that. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Did I mention I have Laguna as a new sponsor? Really? Yes. So there's a new saw that arrived today via via freight, which was which was an exciting experience. That's pretty cool. There's a, there's about 55 gallons of Cosmoline on it, though. Oh, I hate that. They didn't clean it for you, huh? They don't, they I gotta don't clean the Cosmoline. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the same stuff they pack uh, guns in, and it's horrible. 
Yeah, it, it, it's taken a while. It's 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 uh, you know I've already been through like two or three old T-shirts and a lot of mineral spirits. So simple green, my brother. Really, it's the way to go. Right now, I think I'm it's green probably nice to get the majority of it off and then kind of clean from there. I'm just trying to check the Twitter feed here. I, haven't, I actually haven't looked at it since we started. <laughs> because we're so engaging, damn it. Ah, somebody's asking about spray finishing. Ooh. We should probably talk. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, but. I hear there's a really inexpensive way to make a good finishing booth. Yeah, I've heard that too. If you spray lacquer and you light it on fire, <laughs> it'll be an exciting finishing experience. I uh, there was one time where I did spray a bunch of lacquer and I forgot to turn off the switch on the furnace. Hmm. And when it when it clicked on, there was about two seconds there where I was wondering if I was going to die. But the good news is I was high as a kite. Because You just didn't care. <laughs> if you went, who cares? Yeah, come like, on. Here, here I come. I don't care. Yeah, so uh, Vic says try Simple Green. Simple Green for the Cosmoline. Yeah. And, uh, That's obscene. Yeah, and of course other people are saying, you know, brake cleaner or uh, James is saying use brake cleaner. Uh, other people are saying just go ahead and use Toxic Waste. Nothing wrong with that. Toxic waste works. I'm yeah. from Jersey, so I know all about it originally. Yeah, I used a lot of the blue blue shop towels. They held it better than uh, the white shop towels, and I didn't want to go through too many sheets or T-shirts, not sheets, shirts. She shirts. She shirts. Do you have sheet shirts? Sheep shirts. Let's see. Cosmoline. Yeah, there's people who forget to take that out of the barrels of their guns before they test fire it. I put a little cosmic on my lips, and now I can ship it to China. This will be fresh and moist, so. <laughs> yes, Vic, I will be buying a bucket of beers tomorrow. I don't know where I'll be, but I'll find a place to buy buckets of beers just like last year. Why doesn't Vic just come into the hangout? Vic, the hangout's public. What did he pee on? Pee, pee on? Did he pee on the Cosmoline? Yeah, tw that was Vic's tweet. Oh, no, yeah, he, I guess he's saying he was urinating. I peed on mine, yeah. I peed on my Cosmoline. <laughs> Sounds like a jailhouse confession. Okay, it looks like Jointer. I'm all caught up. I Just peed on mine. Bleach. That didn't work, but I had to pee. Mr. Clean and bleach and hot water will eat Cosmoline. I don't think I want to put hot water all over my new... No. <laughs> no, and I don't know if I would mix Mr. Clean and bleach because you don't know if it has ammonia in it and you don't want to... You don't want to you know, die. I mean, you know, I mean, if you want to recreate World War I, the Western Front, I mean, there are probably more effective ways to do it, but not many. Yeah. Vic is still packing for... He's packing Pasadena. for Woodchat. Oh, for Pasadena. So I, I need to pack. I still uh, have to no, pack. You don't need to pack. Noon. You well, don't leave till tomorrow is, night. Yeah, but I'm bringing my wife, and so she's upstairs probably pissed at me right now because she's I'm not packing. upstairs packing. <laughs> packing upstairs. I'm going to come up. Everything's my wife doesn't food. like it when I pack for myself. My no. flight leaves in nine hours, and I haven't started packing yet. You so let's try and solve it. Adam's problem if we can. Yeah, look, what, was it again? Adam at uh, Wildworks 26. He's saying he can't get a good finish. What's going on here? Something's going on. He's saying he can't get a good finish. What? And he's he can never get a he doesn't have enough money to get a good decent uh, spray setup. He can never get a good finish with the spray in the can. Adam. So I'm just Adam. trying to figure out, like, how can we help well, if you? If you're using the spray in the can without having to use rattle cans, it, it, no, you can you you can get a good finish with rattle cans. It's I know technique. You can. I use the I use Deft uh, Deft spray lacquer for touch up. Yep. 
and a lot of it's technique. A lot of people sp spray spray like this. Yeah, right. no, it's it's so that's not technique. right. That's not that? right. It's that's lots of little light passes, smooth sweeping motions. It's got to be exactly like you're using HVLP, just. Yeah, so I I have two out. tips. One one would be technique is is uh, I think um, Mark Spagnuolo has some good videos on on technique for spray finishing. So I'd check that out yeah. if it's technique. Um, cans. The only th issue I have with cans are um, for larger projects. You get to the end of a can and it starts to sputter, and then you're you screwed because you got big splotches. Yeah. But if you want to get into spray finishing and do it on kind of on the cheap, the um, the Rockler cheapo turbine they have there, I think it's like yeah. eighty nine or hundred bucks or something like that. It does a it does a fairly decent job for for an entry level spray finish. I used it, it for one, years. And, is it one of those things where you're getting a good value? <laughs> The money, or the is it because it's not as now. good as a better? It's not experience going to be frustrated. I didn't catch that. You were all broken up. Yeah. All right. Long is Island. Who knew? Is an unexperienced user on a cheap system going to just be frustrated? Um, before I had that system, I wasn't experienced, and yes, if you're an inexperienced, you should practice on cardboard or whatever. Make sure you get your spray pattern down, but working on the technique before yeah. you do a serious piece. But it's really not too too difficult once you get the hang of it. You know, keeping a steady steady motion, going out past the edges of your piece. Yes. Um, you know, not too close, not too far. There, there's not, not a whole lot of. Well, you, you also you also don't want to swing from the elbow. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, you want to move across distance. at the same equidistant robotically. We, ju you know, it's it's funny that Adam brings this up because we just had a wood chat about um, spray finishing not too long ago, where you can get fairly inexpensively, and some people have had good luck with the um, purple HVLP guns from uh, Harbor Freight, hmm. uh, where you plug it into a regular compressor and it's a top feed uh, HVLP. Conversion gun, yeah, yeah, and Holy and cow. it's super cheap, and they've had great, great success with it. So I think that you don't need a lot of money to get into spray finishing. The caveat is though you've got to have a big enough compressor. You do have to have a big enough compressor. Now I I talked to the guy, gosh dang it, what was his name? Who was he was in the wood chat? I will find it right now. Uh, Bill Griggs posted a link to the the gun I'm talking about. The price seems to have gone up since when I bought it, but uh, it's still not too too expensive to get started. And um, Mark Cherry puts in a good point: make sure the gun is clean. Yeah, you know, cheap guns work if if they're clean. Yeah, make sure that you clean up afterwards. It's the worst part of spray finishing by far is the clean up afterwards. But if you don't do it, you're going to be miserable in the next go around. Yeah. So you guys, how much? Do, do you guys all use spray finish? Who uses spray finish and very right often? Right here. It's my do favorite. You? Love it. I'm 50-50. Um, no? I'm, I'm, you know, I own, actually, right now, I'm broadcasting from on top of the uh, HVLP box for the system I bought. <laughs> but the reality is, I mean, a uh, rag and, and, uh, and, and diluted finishes, for me, I get such a great finish with them. Yeah. I, I'm just really reluctant to go back to, you know, try another technique. Yeah, so I, I agree. That's why I ask because that's what I use most of the time is just wipe on, just glue it down. I've used the spray systems, and I always found that the cleanup makes it not worth it. Any time savings from the spray, I lost in setup and cleanup. My dad's got an, uh, an Apollo HV8, HVLP system, and I, I, I absolutely loathe using it because it's so much work to set up and clean when you're done. Yeah. So I spray a lot unless it's small. If it's a small project, I'll use like a wiping varnish. And... I I only use things I can clean up with water or alcohol so far, um, and man, I'm telling you, I've got it. I I've got it to the point where I don't think for a large project I would do anything else. For a small project, it doesn't make sense 
because you're going to spray more finish off the project than on the project. But for large projects, and I'll usually do, um, I'll usually do uh, if I'm going to tint the wood, I'll use a water or alcohol based dye, like a trans tint or general finishes. And then I'll just do tons and tons and tons of de-wax shellac because it dries so fast. Um, and then I'll finish with general finishes and durovar. And what I like about it is I can spray, I can start finishing and finish finishing all in one day. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, like with the oil varnish blend, it's 24 hours between coats and blah, 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 blah. But, um, and so, and because I use shellac below the water-based endurovar, even though the endurovar has tint to it and doesn't look plastically like plasticky like other other water-based finishes. Shellac really is. The great. shellac makes the wood look beautiful and it dries in 20 minutes. So I can literally spray a coat and usually by the time I'm done spraying, like I'll go get a drink of water and come out and be able to sand it and I can just fly through this stuff. So I buy um, I buy the uh, D-Wax shellac and the quart cans Four yep. at a time. The seal coat? Yeah, I buy it yep. four at a time usually. Yep. And then I have Endurovar. Cause, and it, I would use all Endurovar. It dries pretty quick, but it's more expensive. So. Why and, do you bother uh, with the Endurovar? Because the, uh, because the shellac, if you set a drink down, you make the shellac mushy. All you do are tables? I mean, I've done, yeah, I've been drinks. doing tables and stuff. And, and, uh, and so I just want I want a top coat that's going to really be tough and scratch resistant. That that makes yeah. sense on the table, but the last few things I've done, I've just done about between ten and twelve coats of shellac, and I'm using the seal coat. I'm cutting it down to yeah. I'm, I'm putting a couple coats of half pound cut on, and then the rest one pound cut, and I'm doing it all with a rag. And with a rag, in a day I can get twelve coats on because it dries so quick. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I primarily use the shellac as a base coat, as a seal coat, and um, yeah. you know, and I cut it like I said. You know, I, I think I posted about this earlier this week. I, I cut it about half and half with the natured alcohol, and um, you know, the best part about it is when you when you sand down with 400 grit after you put that on, and um, it, it's you glass. Can't get, it, you can't get it smoother. I mean, there's not. I mean, you can scrape and plane and all that other business, but man, once you get that shellac down and then you sand it out with yeah. 400. I mean, you're talking about you put anything on that, and it's going to be great. Yeah. So, and then when I clean, like when I when I clean out the uh, water-based dye, I just uh, dump what's left back in the can, mm -hmm. rinse out the gun as well as I can. And spray through. Put a bunch of hot water in there and spray it. And while I spray it, I kind of shake the can a little bit. Then I'll put alcohol in to spray the water out. And then I'm ready. For, then I'm ready for shellac. So I spray all my shellac. Then at the end of the shellac, I spray alcohol through to clean the shellac out. Then after the alcohol dries out of the gun and the jar, I'm ready to spray whatever the heck I want. So I I haven't taken my gun apart and cleaned it with a brush in, in a long time. And the last time I did, there was. No problem. Cleaning the gun after spraying paint sucks. It's thicker. Yeah. yeah. Just um, just treating the paint so it'll go through the gun. I don't have that pro I don't have that problem. I've got I've got different needle sizes and um, yes. I put ten percent water in there and I put on a different needle and I'm good to go. So. Hey Matt. I'm going to head out. i got to start getting ready. Hey, man, it was great for us to uh, come on and uh, have a minute to uh, be with you guys tonight. And I uh, really yeah. appreciate us uh, getting this time worked out. And uh, um, you look forward to seeing you guys out in Pasadena. You got it. Thanks for I want to see pictures. Out. I want to see reports. We'll do it. And I want to see the water. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sign off, too. i got to okay. get a couple hours before flight time. Cool. Alright, thank you. Guys. Guys. Right. So Diami, you've tried paint before with the HVLP and, and not had good luck? I hated it. I'll never do it again. I'll, I know how to paint with a brush and a roller and I'm not going to say I'm fast, but I'm pleased with the results. And uh, I would never do an HVLP. You're, you're giving me a look like 
I, I oh, would no, never I pay. I don't pay for it. Twitter for when I was doing that look. Sorry. Oh. I was looking at the chat room. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you deserved a lot. Yeah, I've I've painted rooms with the HVLP gun, and it's it was just way too much work. By the time you by the time well, you thin would, the plate, I would paint, never use paint the room. Well, I did it. Yeah, on I would a, never use a gun to spray paint a room, but I did it on uh, in my old house. I built this massive crown molding with tons of dentals. It was like three hundred dentals, so yeah. I used the gun so I didn't have to brush every dental. Yes, that makes sense. Um. <laughs> hey, Randy is the spray guy. Ah. Well, uh, hello, Randy. Randy is the guy that had the cheap gun. Randy, get in here and tell us about that cheap gun again, the conversion Come on, gun. Randy. Come on, Randy. So I would I would never use the HVOP to spray paint to spray a room, but on furniture I've got really good results and um but the, the, the key to really good results when painting furniture, if you want that really smooth finish, is um, primer. And so many people skip the primer. And so when I've wanted really like glass smooth painted finishes, I'll um, prime, sand, if, if the sand, even if it's light sanding, if that took off down to bare wood, Prime again, sand again, yeah. and then I might even shellac it, and then paint it. I wonder if yes. you shellacked, hit it with 400 grit, then primed, then painted. Yeah, that might be better. That way you kind of freeze the wood fibers, and you get a the smoother surface first, yeah. and then you go from there. It might save some of that. Yeah, and I wow, really... The army's gone. No, they're all gone now. Everybody, the whole world's coming into an end here. Maybe it's that's okay. a the Mayans. Pod. It's the Mayans. <laughs> yeah, it is the Mayans. And Diami's back. He's a Mayan. <laughs> Let's see. Vic right. says he drinks alcohol when he uses shellac. Go. I've done uh, that. He does. I tend to drink alcohol whenever I finish. You were talking about uh, which I, I was cutting an AccuSpray uh, HVLP. Uh, uh, Tom, but you still are cutting in and out. <laughs> Tom, you were talking about shellacking under. Yeah, I'm going to cut out of this in a second. But you were paint. talking about shellacking under paint. If you're going to shellac under paint, yeah. use use Zinsser's bin primer because it is shellac, but it's white tinted shellac. Yeah. Nice. Um, it's 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 a, it's a well, shellac yeah, base. Primer. Yeah. The other so thing yes, you can do is, is use um, there's a target coating says tinted water based lacquers. Water based lacquers that are tinted, mm -hmm. and they really give you great, um, great results. So Neil Lehman's nephew Cody, mm -hmm. he builds uh, like little step stools for children, and he uses the uh, water based lacquer. And he gets now, great you, results. What do you guys think about the water-based products? I mean, they seem to be getting better. I don't see the need for them. I'm sure they are getting better, but why? I don't. Here's I why. just. I I'll don't you, see the I'll need. Tell you for why them. I use water-based? Because I I spray my finishes in my garage. That's a good reason. And I don't want it to explode, and I don't want it to go into uh, the house. I see. I any bad fumes in the house. I'm not being snotty here, but legitimately, I see that as a challenge. That's just <laughs> something I need to do. To if I'm gonna spray, I need to do something to to deal with the fumes. Yeah. Um, oh, I thought you wanted to try to poison the house. Well, so you're gonna have to deal with the fumes either way, because waterborne finishes still have chemicals in them and glycol yeah. ethers. But for me, um, they are even even though they even though you still have to deal with the fumes, you don't have to deal with explosive fumes. And it's not as bad. Right? The VOC content's not as bad. So I'll, I'll turn your question on its head. Okay. Yami, if you can get a really good water-based finish that isn't solvent-based and doesn't explode and has low VOC, then why is there a need for the older finishes? Okay, I'll, I'm going to bring this back to work where we use lots of nasty solvent-based adhesives and we have for yeah. decades. And 
the solvent-based adhesives work. We've been using low VOC and water-based adhesives for the last two years, and they don't work. So I don't personally trust that the water-based adhesives are going to perform as well as we know the solvent-based adhesives will. There's no question about the performance of solvent-based adhesives. And while I know that water-based adhesives are getting better, there's more questions about them than there are the solvent-based ones. And I don't use a whole lot of different finishes. I use wipe-on varnish. I use shellac. I'm not into a yeah. lot of different finishing. So it's not like I'm going for these really potent, uh, you know, pre-cat shellac or something like that. Right. Um, but, you know, for the, for the stuff I do, I'd rather go with something that I have no questions about. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you're saying is that there's a, there is a quality problem. There's a quality question. There might not even be a problem anymore, but there's a quality question. Yeah. And finishing is by no means a fun part of the project for me, so if I can yeah. never risk having an issue with it, I, I don't. Hey, there's Randy. Hey, hi. Randy, we were just asking, we were just having a conversation again around your um, inexpensive HVLP conversion gun and the success you've had there because there's a guy named uh, Adam Wile, Wile Works. Who's, who's trying to get into spray finishing on the cheap. He's having really bad luck. Well, I don't know. I, um, you know, I, I think the, a lot of the inexpensive um, uh, sprayers are all made by the same outfit over in China and stuff like that. I mean, it's not rocket science to, to make these things. Um, the, the, the sprayer that I have... Uh, there's an outfit out in uh, San Diego that uh, sells, uh, you know, spring equipment for cars and, and yeah. paint and things like that. Uh, it's, I don't know, TCP, something another. Anyway, you, you can, um, they have the uh, the sprayer that I'm using, and I'm having a lot of success with it. What I like is the fact that the, the, the different nozzles are, are very inexpensive. I have uh, three different nozzle types. And um, you know, I, I don't need a, a huge compressor or anything. I use a touch-up gun uh, because I don't have huge projects, and it, it I can clean the gun in, in uh, minutes. You know, it's just, yeah. it doesn't. Uh, uh, there's not much that it's holding in terms of uh, of um, um, you know uh, whatever I'm spraying. So uh, you know, it, it works out well. Yeah. But, you know, you didn't spend hundreds of dollars on this system. Oh, no, not at all. No, they, they, the gun itself was, I don't know, like uh, 30 bucks, you know, and I have a compressor that's, uh, you know, uh, 99 bucks. Um, and then I, I bought a, uh, uh, you know, a regulator and a filter and things like that for, you know, another, you know, 30 bucks or something like that. So, you know, my, my whole system is less than $200. That's cool, and you get pretty dang good results from from what I've seen from your blog. No, oh, I appreciate. It. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I feel comfortable with it and everything. I, uh, in fact, I was uh, making some uh, uh, supports for a mirror just the other day, and you know, I so I just you know, spray the uh, the dye with it, and um, uh, you know, then spray some. Uh, shellac, you know, to protect the dye, and then I, I use uh, solely a water base uh, for finishes, and, yeah. and it, it's, again, it's the reason why you were talking about, the, you know, I'm doing it in my garage, you know, I don't want to stink up the house. Yeah, you know, Diami, um, I can't remember, yeah, it was you that asked, why do I do the water based at all? Yeah, why not just shellac? I understand the, the cup issue, yeah. but on things that aren't tables that people are going to rest drinks on. Yeah, there was one other issue that I forgot, which is when you spray a water when you spray the general finishes water based dye stain or mm -hmm. other water based dye, um, and then you put a water based finish on top of it. There's a chance that the water borne finish okay. is going to bring up that dye, right? Mm hmm. Um, especially if you use some of the dyes that have a little bit of finish in them, mm -hmm. right? So the reason I, I one of the reasons I put shellac in between those is because, as Randy said, the shellac seals off the dye. Right. So I know my dye isn't going to change by putting the shellac on it. 
and then when I put the water based on there, I know it's not going to change again. And so, so the other cool thing you can do is you can do layering. You could do um, dye, shellac, and then a different color and mixture of dye to add layering of color, and then you can put the water based on top of that if you wanted. Um, it's just it's a that that's a cool technique, and people have done that for. Um, Craftsman style furniture. And now my phone's ringing. So that's probably my wife. And with that, after two hours yeah. on my butt on this stool, yeah. I'm going to have to roll. I'm going to say goodnight also. It's 11, 11 o'clock on the East Coast. Tonight. Peace out, guys. Yeah, hey, thanks well, for having us, guys. Later. Good night. Randy, I know we just you just got here, but we are going to end wood chat now as soon as the phone's Okay, stopped. No problem. All right, bye-bye. Um, thanks. Thanks for dropping by, everybody. This is wood chat for October 10th. Uh, random talk about sharpened hand tools, woodworking America, and spray finishing. And we'll see you next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. Bye-bye.